The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and always, and especially today as we do commemorate those terror attacks of September 11th. Our text for our message this morning is from Matthew, the 18th chapter. And we, as we began our text today, we started out with a brief interchange between Peter and between Jesus. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. It seems like a somewhat appropriate text for this morning, especially as we remember this 10th anniversary. It seems as though, as, uh, even though we're over here in California, that all of us can remember where we were when we heard those news stories. That first, the two towers were obliterated. Then the, the Pentagon was attacked. And finally, of course, those who bravely fought down the plane in Pennsylvania. And even, uh, even you know, as you think back, we know that this had an effect, not just in New York, not just here in California, not just here in our country, but even around the world. And we're still experiencing the effects today. Now, uh, the first response, I think, of many people was fear. Is this going to keep happening? Are more people going to come and more, more terrorists going to destroy our homes, our communities? But then that fear turned into something else, didn't it? In fact, I think there was a sense of indign indignation that formed. A sense of community that formed in that indign indignation. I mean, just listen to some of the country music songs that came out right then. The country music songs that threatened all the terrorists that we were coming for them. Uh, even bumper stickers pr printed out by the truckload that claimed that if you did not stand with us, then get out of the way or something's going to happen. And you all know, because right after that, even if it's dimmed a little, that, the, that there was a sense of unity that formed. But the unity that formed, that indignation that caused the unity, it formed out of a sense of revenge, didn't it? Revenge. Something that we, we don't like it when someone takes revenge on us. We don't like it when someone ha takes revenge on our lives. But we, we, it's hard for us not to have that vengeful attitude, isn't it? It's hard for us to not, to not to hold a grudge. Not to look at someone and say, you did this to me. Now, don't misunderstand me. I think that right after that, after 9-11, after we needed a sense of unity to come. But that revenge that came, I don't know if that's exactly what we needed. Because notice, one thing we can say for certain is that there was not a sense of forgiveness. Even among pew-sitting Christians, there was not a sense of forgiveness after 9-11. There was a sense of we need to get those people back for what they did to us. We need to punish them for how they hurt us, how they hurt our families. And can you blame us? I mean, here we had lost, well, some people lost their children. Some people lost their parents. Uh, there's a new, a new, an article in People magazine talking about children who were born who would never meet their parents because of 9-11. Some people lost their spouses. Some people, some people lost close friends that they care about. And so when we look at that, it's hard not to have that sense of revenge, isn't it? It's hard not to, and, and we know that it's not just a terror attack that, that strikes this, this feeling of vengeance in us, is it? It's not just when we, when we, are, when we sit there and we think about that terror, but, we think, but even when we think about things that happen in our lives. When we think about things that people have done to us, we know that we oftentimes, rather than taking a, uh, an attitude of forgiveness towards them, we take an attitude of revenge, an attitude of vengeance, an attitude of, of a grudge holding, if that's a, po a possible attitude. In reality, we know that it's not the terror attacks that really, that really bring out that attitude in us. But it's when someone close to us hurts us, isn't it? It's when someone who we care about a lot hurts us. And that is when these feelings really come out. These feelings of revenge bubble up in us. They're un uncontrolled feelings that come out. It's when a close friend, a family member, has betrayed us. How dare they? We put our trust in them. It's when a child has put a trust in their parent, and that parent abuses them. How could they ever trust anybody? It's when a spouse catches his or her husb husband or wife cheating. How could they forgive that? It's even when, at times, an attitude we take towards God, isn't it? We look at him and we say, how can we forgive you for, for, for making us go through this in our life? It's not fair. We like, well, maybe we don't like 
we have these feelings of revenge that come. These feelings of revenge that do we seem to be un- out of our control. And these revenge feel- lead to pain. It's a pain that's kind of seared on our hearts, isn't it? Something that goes with us wherever we go. It's a pain that no matter how we try to drop it, how we try to get rid of it, it we just we can't. And then we, we start to justify ourselves a little bit, don't we? We justify ourselves by saying, well, well, it's okay for me to not forgive because God has forgiven that. Right? So why should I forgive them? We justify ourselves by saying, well, what they did was so awful. I could not possibly forgive them. We justify ourselves by, by saying that they never asked for forgiveness. And we come up with an excuse a mile long. All these lists. And the older we get, the longer these lists grow. And we say, why should we forgive? But then we have a parable like we had today. And it kind of makes us squirm a little bit, doesn't it? The parable of the unmerciful servant makes us squirm a little because as we read those words, we, we cannot help but see, see ourselves or see others as that unmerciful servant. And if that's not bad enough, we, we go back a few texts, back to Matthew chapter 6, and we read, Jesus' word right after the Lord's Prayer. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Those are hard words, aren't they? Because we like to to live in the Gospel. We enjoy living in the promises of God. The promise is that, that He will forgive us. We enjoy living in that truth because we know that by that forgiveness we have salvation. But we struggle to forgive ourselves. We struggle to forgive others who have done that harm to us. As often as we try to forgive, it, it, it bubbles on our heart again. and We think about them on, on, on their birthday. We think about them on, on Chris, at Christmas time. Even when we're laying awake at night, we think about how we can't forgive that person. And so when we look at the parable, we struggle because we, 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 do, we can see ourselves sometimes as an unmerciful servant. We can see ourselves as experiencing the cruelty of another unmerciful servant. But there's one perspective we cannot take in the parable. We cannot take the perspective of the master, can we? We cannot have that perspective because when we look at that master, we see a debt that was so great that not one of us could take on. We see a debt that was beyond our comprehension that only one person could take, and that is our Savior. Only one person could handle that great weight. Only one person could bear that cross. That was Christ. Because even as as we try to forgive, even as we try to, to, to let that go, we know that we cannot. We know that our sinful nature keeps holding on. We kind of pack it alongside with us. And everywhere we go, it carry, we carry it like baggage alongside us. And we don't, we don't let it go. But only Christ could. Only He could see such a great debt and forgive us of it. And this is incomprehensible to us because it's not like what we would do. It's not in our nature to forgive. But Jesus paid the price. He paid the price of that great debt for us. He paid that price because of, because of our unwillingness to forgive. And maybe, maybe you don't realize just how great this debt is, but as we, as we look at the text in Matthew 18 there, it, you, you maybe notice that it says 10,000 denarius, or 10,000 talents, excuse me. Well, the word that actually is used there is the word myrios. And Myrios you probably sounds a little familiar because it sounds like our English word myriad. But that Myrios, if we go with the idea of the 10,000 talents, it's, well, let's break that down. We'll do a little math this morning. 10,000, or one talent equals 6,000 denarii. One talent, so six, one talent, 6,000 denarii. One denarius is equal to one day's wage. 6,000 denarii, one day's wage. So 6,000 days wage. But we still have 10,000 times that, don't we? In fact, when we look at it, we realize that it would take 60 million days, 60 million days, to pay for that. 
or in other words, 240,000 years. If any of you are planning on living that long, let me know. But there's no way. See, that is the beauty of grace. That is the amazingness of God's grace to us. It's because even though we are so far, so far in debt to him, 240,000 years in debt to him, he wiped it clean. He wiped it clean because we are his children, not because of something we've, did, we've done, not because of our deservingness, not because we've lived a, a good life, a, a pretty good life, an okay life, but because, because of his great love for us, his great mercy for us. Maybe this is so hard, a little hard for us to understand, but the psalmist does a great job in Psalm 103. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. God took away our sin. He wiped it clean, made us white as snow, and then he turned his back on us. As far as the east is from the west, we, he, he promised to never look at it again. Every time he forgives our sins, he doesn't hold it against us. He doesn't remember it and file it away for a later argument or something like that. But he wipes it clean. And that is the beauty of God's grace for us. And that, I think this would be the perfect spot to, to stop the sermon right here. Because this is one of the things I love to talk about is God's forgiveness and His grace. But this isn't where Jesus stopped His sermon, is it? This isn't where He stopped and we wouldn't be faithful to the text. But He continues on and if you have your bulletin in front of you, you can read along with me. After the unmerciful servant had abused his, his fellow servant, the master calls him in. The master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brothers from your heart. Ouch. See, that, that, that's, that's the hard part about that text. That's where we really, where the rubber meets the road with the text, doesn't it? Because we have seen this great forgiveness. It's not like we haven't witnessed great forgiveness in our lives. It's not like we haven't seen this precious gift ourselves. But, it, but we aren't willing to share it. So many people, so many people hold on to it. And it's a, it takes away from you. It sucks at your lives. It sucks at your, your, away from your relationship with God. The more we wrestle with it, the more we struggle with, with, our, with knowing God. Because when we can't forgive, how can we understand God's forgiveness for us? When we can't forgive, how can we truly know that God, out of His great love, would look upon us sinners and say, I forgive you? We can't. We can't because the bitterness and the pain and the hate, it, it keeps us from seeing that. And so Christ is commanding us here. Christ is commanding us as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. He's commanding us to forgive. And it's not going to be easy. In fact, it's going to tear our hearts to shreds. Because I bet, without having it, any of you hold up your hands, there are some of you who, still, who, know someone, who, who have someone who comes to your mind when you think of someone you haven't forgiven. I'm sure that there are some of you, and you don't have to say out loud, who cheered when Osama bin Laden was captured and executed. I'm sure that there are some of you who every time you hear about terrorists getting killed, you have a silent cheer inside of you. But that is not forgiveness. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is looking at our enemies. Looking at those who have hurt us, those who have done truly awful things to us. And saying, I forgive you. Speaking those same words that God spoke to us. I forgive you. And as we start to forgive, as we offer that forgiveness to others, we do grow. We do grow spiritually. But first, as you grow, it's like a muscle. When, you, when a muscle, when you're building muscles, they first have to tear, right? They have to rip first so that they can scar over and grow again. It's the same thing as we grow spiritually. There's that painful time where we, where we forgive that person who has hurt us. Where we forgive someone who we just thought we'd never forgive, who we thought was unforgivable. But as we grow, 
as it scars over, we start to see how God works in us, how He works in our hearts. And we would not be able to do this on our own. There's no chance of that. But only by the power of the Spirit. Only by the power of the Holy Spirit in us can we offer true forgiveness. There's people who who never come to understand this. Who bear these grudges their whole lives. Who carry these grudges to their very graves. What a painful way. What a painful way to die. Knowing that, that, that there's still that sense of revenge. That sense, that sense of hate. We have a God. We have a God who looked past our ungratefulness, our sinfulness, our great debt, and loved us despite that. Who looked at each one of you, and in the water of holy baptism, He said, Welcome. Come to me. And He refreshes us and gives us strength. And each time, each time we hear the words of absolution, I forgive you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those are not my words. But those are God's very words to you. And each time we go to the altar, and we taste again of that the bread and that wine, we know that it is the forgiveness of Christ's body and blood coming right to us. It's not whether or not we're worthy. It's not whether or not we have forgiven enough because ultimately that will never be the case. But it was that Christ was worthy. That Christ forgave us. That He took our place. Martin Luther, as he he writes about the the fifth petition in the large catechism, he helps us to understand a little better. The sign is therefore attached to this petition. That when we pray, we remember the promise and we reflect thus. Dear Father, for this reason I come to you I I pray to you to forgive me. Not that I can make satisfaction or can merit anything by my works, but because you have promised and attach the seal there too, that I should be as sure as though I had absolution pronounced by you yourself. And that is the promise of forgiveness. That even as sinful as we are, even as many grudges as we hold, as often as we come to the Lord and ask Him forgiveness, he will again repeat those words, I forgive you. I forgive you. And that forgiveness, that forgiveness opens to us the promise that one, way, one day we will be free from the pains of this world. One day, one, way, one day we will leave this world, whether it's because of a painful circumstance or because God takes us quietly. But when we leave this world, We won't have the memories of pain. We won't have the memories of hurt. We'll live with our Lord in peace. We'll live with Him in life eternal. And that is the promise that forgiveness brings. That is the promise that salvation brings. And that is the promise that our Lord invites each of us to. Amen. Let us pray. Father, so often it is hard to forgive. Help us, Lord, that as we face those times where it is difficult, where we don't see a way to do so, that we may find strength from your Spirit. Help us, Lord, that as we face those trials, those difficulties, that we may trust that as you have forgiven us, that we can forgive others. Lord, even even with such a great debt, you have shown your mercy to us. And we praise you. We praise you because you have seen past us and out of your great love, you have had mercy on us. Lord, may we show that same mercy to others. Let us not forgive because we have to, but because we were first forgiven by you. Amen. May God's peace be with you now and always. Amen.